Hello, everyone. My name is Christine Hong. I am the director of the program in critical race and ethnic studies. I'm also the co-director, along with Neda Atanasovsky, of a new Center for Racial Justice. Um, we are the very proud sponsors of today's event. And I also want to give a shout out to Undocumented Student Services, USS, which has helped to fund the course Undocu Studies, um, which is the context for today's event. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about the format of today's webinar. Um, basically, the chat has been disabled, but you have the Q&A function, and that's at the menu on the bottom um, of your screen. And throughout the event, um, as our speakers are giving their presentations, and then also during the formal Q&A itself, please feel free to put comments, questions, observations in the Q&A, and those will be um, uh, facilitated by the students in this class, um, the student facilitators of this class. And I want to say one last thing too. I'm the faculty sponsor for this inaugural course on Docu Studies, and this course comes from well over a year of planning by um, principally undocumented students, students from mixed race, uh, mixed, excuse me, mixed as families um, who have um, developed this course. And it also comes, and I should say this, from us standing on the shoulders of so many student activists, undocumented student activists who came before, including uh, the students who were part of the Scene Collective, who really transformed the culture and the climate of this um, entire campus. And so I just wanted to say that um, the context in which this event was planned is a horizontally structured student course um, that comes from students who uh, were collectively attempting to create a space of um, critical inquiry as well as collective liberation. So, you know, uh, Without further ado, I will introduce, um, I'll just yield the floor to Elias, who will introduce the speakers. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Elias. I use they them pronouns, and um, I'm a CRES major at UC Santa Cruz. And um, yeah, and our two guest speakers today are Julio Salgado, who is the co-founder of Dreamers Adrift and the Migrant Storytelling Manager for the Center for Cultural Power. His status as an undocumented queer artivist has fueled the contents of his visual art, which depict key individuals and moments of the Dream Act and the migrant rights movement. <clears throat> Yossi Marres is a nationally acclaimed poet and public speaker, born in Guerrero, Mexico, and raised in Eastside San Jose, Reyes explores themes of migration and sexuality in his work. The advocate named Reyes one of 13 LGBT Latinos changing the world and Remezcla included Reyes on their list of 10 up and coming Latinx poets you need to know about. And um, they're also very good friends with each other and have done many presentations before. So <laughs> um, I'm, we're really excited to um, host you all today and um, hopefully whole space for um, joy, learning, and just um, critical inquiry, like Christine says. So um, yeah, and I also just want to quickly introduce um, Ivan, who will be helping me co-facilitate this. Um, and I, do you want to introduce yourself real quick, Ivan? Yes. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Ivan, or Ivan Vega. And I'm really happy to be here today. And thank you to our guest presenters for being here with us. Yeah, I'm a sociology and LLS double major. I'm a co-coordinator with the Undocu Studies course um, sponsored through the CRES program. Um, so yeah, and I'm gonna also introduce our other co-facilitator, um, Seda, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Briseida Gonzalez. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm really excited to be here today with you all. Um, I can't wait to see what's 
coming with the presenters. <laughs> And last but not least, we also want to thank the staff who labored to make this event possible, Taylor Ains Ainsley, Shantae Larkins, and um, Lisa Seppel as well. So thank you all so much. Thank you everyone again uh, for joining us and helping to organize this. Um, and so now we'll pass over the floor to Julio and Yosimar, and they have a Quick presentation for us. Awesome. Hola, buenas tardes a todos. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, my name is Josima Reyes. I'm a poet, I'm a writer. And you know, it's super, super exciting just to know that there's a class for and by undocumented individuals. And who would have thought that when we were all struggling, you know, and try to figure out what we're gonna do with our lives. Now we can only talk amongst each other and, you know, just dive into the things that, that, that we deal with. And I think spaces like this are super important just for us to take inventory of everything that we deal with. You know, I think oftentimes as undocumented folks and students, we're so used to telling our life stories as educational to try to convince people to like us. But I think, I think we're ridding ourselves out of the burden of education and us just existing for us to deal with our own things and problems that we have. It's a really, really special space. So thank you all for having this and creating this. And I'm super, super excited to be here. Julio. Yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you to everybody who made it possible. I'm always, um, you know, excited to when, you know, we get invited to do this type of uh, presentations and talk about our art, come in as artists, um, you know, and I, at first I was like, you know, I'm not a professor, I don't do lectures, I just draw, but, you know, when I started noticing people were talking about my art, I'm like, wait, I'm still here, you know, like, I should be able to talk, um, you know, about my own art while I'm still alive, which is, you know, a big one too. Uh, and always excited to share space with, you know, Yossi, we promise to behave. Um, and so I'll, I'll get started. Um, I'll, I'm going to go ahead. Um, you know, I'm a visual artist, so I'm going to show you art. <laughs> um, let me get this started. And I'm going to set my timer because, you know, I want to make sure that Yossi has time to talk. <laughs> uh, let me see. Okay, can, can y'all see it? Yes. Okay. Awesome. <clears throat> so again, yeah, my name is Julio Salgado. I am, you know, he him pronouns and um, I am an artist uh, who happens to be undocumented um, and queer and those things have had a huge uh, impact in, in the kind of, you know, work I've, you know, I've put out there. Um, you know, I, I, I feel that um, as people who, um, you know, just when you're poor and you know you add undocumented, you are all this stuff like the lack to uh, of access to mental uh, health services, like a therapist. It, it's really hard to get by. But growing up and you know making art and putting a lot of this stuff out into the world, that was my therapy. Like that was my way of of dealing with a lot of the you know the the BS uh, <laughs> that comes with with being undocumented, right? Um, I always like to show this image when, when you know, I, I, I start talking about my work. Um, you know, this, this image uh, was inspired by this photograph. Um, that's my parents and that's my sister and that's me. Uh, around 1995 uh, was the year that uh, we came to the US. And, um, you know, I made that image. My parents are courageous and responsible and that's why I'm here. Uh, and it was a collaboration between and, and my good, me and my friend, uh, um, Nancy Mesa, who is a uh, organizer and documenter organizer out of LA. And we really started thinking about the kind of narratives that we were putting out there, you know, around 2010, 2011, which was the year that we were super close, you know, to passing the DREAM Act. Uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with the DREAM Act is, you know, it would, it came, the first introduction was in 2001. Uh, 20 years, almost 20 years ago, uh, when I graduated from high school. And this was like sort of the, the bill that would, would have given us a path to citizenship if you went to school, if you eventually went to college. And, um, you know, for a lot of us who, um, you know, didn't, didn't you know, we, we were struggling to like, oh, what are we going to do after high school? Uh, the Dream Mac 
was, uh, you know, that thing, right, that, that we were clinging and hoping, um, you know, and there were, has been many versions of the Dream Act, literally the last one, the, the latest one was like, you know, at the beginning of the month, Servin reintroduced it. And, and so, you know, at this point, it's just like, oh, God, another version, right, another disappointment. But what we did get, uh, you know, um, you know, yeah, we had DACA, but, but one of the things that for me was the huge, you know, thing was, uh, that we were able to switch the narratives around, you know, coming out as undocumented, right? The thing about it um, that was that we were very focused on us, on the uh, because the Dream Act, we were called dreamers, um, and the narratives were always focused on the young, pobrecitos, poor little immigrants, poor little immigrants, it wasn't their fault. Um, and so we really started thinking about like, you know what, that narrative's kind of messed up for our parents because you know, they became the, 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 the sort of the bad, the bad guys who brought us here at a young age. And, and really, if you think about it, you know, for a lot of us, um, it took courage for our parents to, and responsibility for our parents to make the decision to stay in a new country, right? And so I, you know, I mentioned 1995, uh, I was, you know, we moved here, uh, we ended up staying here, uh, overstaying our, our, our passports. Uh, because my sister got really sick. And so I was put in this um, seventh grade art class and Ms. Gaynor, my, you know, my, my teacher, my art teacher was like, you know, Julio, you will like her, uh, this, this person's art, uh, you know, as we all know, it might sound like a cliche to name Frida Kahlo as, as an inspiration, but like, really, she was it, right? Like, she was like, to see, to see Frida's work when you're like, you know, a 12 year old, you know, a chubby queer immigrant who doesn't speak English. Um, it was, it really made, uh, it, it, it did something to me. And I was like, I wanna do that. I wanna, you know, I wanna lean on the creative side. And growing up, I grew up here in, in, in Long Beach, California. Um, you know, schools like the, the school, the, the schools are very pro art. And so from a young age, I was very, you know, pushed to, you know, to the arts. Um, and, uh, and, um, this is young me, don't mind the fashions. Uh, it was the early 90s and I mean, I'm still, you know, anyways. Uh, <laughs> this, uh, this photo on the left, um, it, was, it was, I mentioned, I was always pushed, you know, to, to the arts um, and supported by my parents, right? Because there's this sort of um, um, stereotype or, you know, a, a reality sometimes that like, you know, when you're immigrant parents, Supporting the arts, it's like, well, why don't you get a job or like go to school for like something that will give you money, right? But my family was always very supportive. That was actually my first art show that I had in the eighth grade. I was repping Hamilton Middle School uh, in Long Beach, in North Long Beach. And um, that was my, you know, that was my, my first art show. Um, uh, and, you know, my family has always been super, um, you know, part of that, of that, you know, pushing me for, uh, or, being supportive of my creative side. Um, on the other side, whenever I talk family, I have to name my tío Chicho. Uh, my tío Chicho, who was um, the first gay man I ever met. Um, when we moved to the U.S., uh, you know, there was there was a time where we couldn't, you know, housing for undocumented people. Um, you know, it's a little tough to you know to find housing when you don't have a background check. I don't know if we, they were doing background checks back in, back then, but now it's it's hard. Um, and, and, you know, I remember my Tio Chicho was like, y'all can stay in my, you know, studio in, you know, in Silver Lake. And, you know, this is back when, before the gentrification of Silver Lake, and you could actually afford to, like, an undocumented queer immigrant can afford to live in Silver Lake. Um, you know, and we moved in with him, right? And so from my Tio Chicho, I learned, um, you know, just being unapologetic about, you know, who you are. And, you know, unfortunately, he left us uh, two years ago. And so, but... My tío Chicho just, you know, was somebody who, to this day, you know, continues to be, um, you know, my. We talk about like, um, you know, as as queer people, we have uh, uh, people that are that inspire us to 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 be immigrants, and we name, you know, of course, the icon, the icons, right? But you know, for me, we I had it in my family. Um, always, 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 you find me drawing, um, you know. And so when I when I finally transferred, uh, I ended up, you know going to uh, community college, Long Beach City College, um, and then eventually I transferred to Cal State Long Beach. I initially was an art major, but I didn't, I didn't quite 
like it. <laughs> uh, uh, I, you know, if there's any art students here, y'all know that being an art student is so expensive. And so, um, you know, I ended up switching my majors to journalism because they were looking for a political cartoonist. And I was like, I can do that. And so, you know, when I eventually transferred to uh, Cal State Long Beach, um, you know, I transferred as an, as an art major. And aside from being part of the school newspaper and doing political cartoons, I always found ways to, you know, connect with communities. And like, you know, we were making, we, we had a zine uh, uh, called Reflejo. Now it took me like nine and nine years to get my BA in journalism, but I always like to show it off because um, you know, there's this sort of uh, uh, pressure that you have to finish school in four years. Uh, well, I'm here to tell you that sometimes when, you know, you are first generation, you're undocumented, you're poor, whatever, you know, the challenges uh, may be, it's just not, it's just impossible. And so um, it took me nine years. And finally, in 2010, I walked, right? I walked with my diploma. And it was a bittersweet moment because when you're in college, you sort of are in this bubble where you feel protected. You know, I felt part of a community. I feel, I feel that, um, yeah, being undocumented was a struggle, but I was seen as a student. Once I was out of there, I was like, what do I do now? And so um, 2010, this happened. Uh, for me, you know, the, this, this, I, I mentioned earlier, 2010 was the year that we got super close to being you know, able to pass the DREAM Act. Um, but in 2010, it was also the time that a lot of undocumented uh, uh, activists, young, younger, they were younger than me. Uh, I always admire uh, the fact that I'm like, I wasn't doing that at 19. You know, again, I was in college for like almost 10 years. Uh, so I was like in my mid 20s, I was super senior. So a lot of these folks were younger and I was like, what are they doing? They're getting arrested. They're gonna, they're gonna get deported. But really what they did, they, they switched the narrative, right? Um, and me being the, you know, I was, I, you know, I wanted to make sure that we documented uh, what was happening. And so I started, you know, making images that I would share on Facebook. Uh, social media has always been a blessing and a curse at the same time, because a lot of us felt comfortable to, uh, can not just comfortable, but like just being able to connect with other people from across the country, um, you know, was just it made it it made it so much easier. Uh, and the cap and gown became this sort of um, you know this symbol of the of the of the dreamer, right? And and while again, you know, it could we could get into this whole conversation about the 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 the, the dreamer uh, label. But for a lot of us, it was it was the first time that that it was like, OK, don't call me legal, call me a dreamer. Right. And uh, using the word undocumented, right, changing certain uh, uh, words. And another thing that was what was beautiful about or amazing badass was that a, lo a lot of the folks who were doing this, um, you know, or organizing uh, undocumented communities were undocumented and queer. Um, and so I wanted to make sure and, you know, add that because, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm queer and I started making these images. Uh, I heard the, you know, the term on queer, um, and I was like, it's important that we need to make sure uh, that folks don't forget that it's, it was queers, you know, it was queers, it's always queers, uh, that, that um, there's sort of this, I don't know, this sort of like, I don't give, you know, I, I don't know if I can curse here, but you know, we're all, we're all grown up here, uh, but you know, you just, you just like, you come out, you know, and 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 there was so many queer folks, and I wanted to make sure that people didn't didn't forget because uh, if we remember from other movements, whenever you're queer, you're always told to like you know hide that part, like you know we're focusing on immigration reform, we're focusing on the Dream Act, um, but it it, it really uh, you know these folks were like she's very unapologetic, and so I had to uh, make images about that. Um, Moving forward to like kind of, uh, well, not moving forward, but like something that I all along through all this time, um, you know, yeah, there was the part of me that that wanted to make art about um, activism and make sure to document what was happening. But also, I am a huge pop culture fan. Uh, Yossi Mark can attest to this. We lived together for a couple of years, but, you know, I was, I'm always watching TV. Uh, and I think that for me, I think for immigrants, uh, uh, period, um, you know, TV and Hollywood, and you know, it's a way that we learn about what it's like to be an American, right? Um, and I love these shows, you know, like Will and Grace, uh, Friends, Gilmore Girls, uh, Roseanne, like, you know, these shows really um, taught me, A, like, you know, my English and like learning about the culture. But one thing that I was like, I don't see, I didn't see myself reflected, you know, in, in a lot of the shows. 
And, you know, even a show like Well and Grace, where, you know, it was, it was it, for its time when it came out in 1998, um, you know, seeing that as somebody who was in high school uh, was like, oh my God, they're talking about key stuff. And, you know, this is on TV on a major network. And it really shifted um, the ways that people thought about, you know, the queer community. Of course, you know, it was super wide. Uh, uh, I couldn't really fully connect to a, a white guy living, you know, in, in Manhattan, but I felt part of me was like, you know, I was inspired, right? And, and one of the things I always think about, there's this old, there's this pressure as, you know, whether you're queer, whether you're brown, black, you know, um, that one piece, when you make a piece of art, it has to encompass, you know, all of the things. But even though this show did not, you know, represent my undocumented identity, there was part of me and I, I felt inspired, right? Like the fact that the, the creators were, you know, you know, from the gay community, I was like, I want to do that, right? And so like, as I've grown up more into like, I need to make sure how, how can we get our stories out there, you know, as undocumented immigrants, but, you know, be told in the right, in the correct way, right? And so, I, you know, I've been hit up by, you know, now it's so weird, right, that Hollywood now it's like really taking notice and, and really going through this sort of like, you know what, maybe we should tell the stories right. Um, and so shows like Madame Secretary have, you know, reached out to me and my art has been in the, in the, in the, in the show. Uh, Vida, you know, the show that this, uh, the, the creator, uh, Tania Saracho, um, reached out and she was like, you know, I want to make sure that your art is in it. What I loved about that uh, experience was that if you look at episode two of the first season, she actually put me on the show. Like, you know, I'm, it's like for like two seconds, but I was like, this is so cool that, you know, it, it's not just the, the, the art itself, but like me as a person, right? And so as I started working in, you know, in, in you know, getting to know like writers, I was like, I, I would get invited into writer's room to, um, to talk about the undocumented experience. But I was like, but where are the undocumented writers? And I know there's a lot of talent in our community. Um, I know there, there's, 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 you know, we're, we're out there. Um, but one of my things is always like, yeah, we want to make sure that Hollywood is a little bit more, um, you know, diverse. And, you know, diverse is like, you know, a word that we're using a lot. But how are we preparing these writers? How are we preparing these creators? How are we investing in the writers, right? Like the, the thing about being an artist is that you have to work on your craft. And a lot of the times when there's all these limitations, even fellowships uh, that don't don't pay uh, or just finding the space, especially right now during a pandemic, um, you know, like how how are how is Hollywood really, um, you know, uh, uh, investing in this artist? And so I'm part of an organization called the Center for Cultural Power. And one of the things that you know I, uh, that I love working in, in this organization is like they go they they're open to my ideas and I'm like you know what we need to start our own fellowship I am nobody in Hollywood nobody knows who I am but I want to make sure that we create spaces where you know we we bring you know and we invest in this in in creative uh, folks and so last year uh, well actually around 2019 I started you know me and and my my colleague Cade Vasco. Uh, we started like really thinking about like, okay, what does a fellowship look like that is specifically uh, targeted for uh, uh, creators of color who want to write for TV? Well, we need mentorship, but well, we need to get them paid. Um, we need to make sure that in the application, uh, people who don't have DACA um, or don't, you know, don't have a social security uh, feel comfortable to apply. Um, and so we did it. <laughs> and, and, you know, if, 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 at first it was supposed to be an in-person uh, situation, but um, the pandemic hit, and so we ended up doing this uh, virtual thing. And so, um, you know, last year was the first cohort that we have of ten folks. Um, you know, the application just went out again uh, this uh, this 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 year, uh, Azu, uh, uh, in March 19, 2021. So if you know any creatives of color uh, who want to write for TV, who are serious about it, and, and why, why I mean by serious is like, you know, there's a sort of like, oh, that sounds like a, that's like, that's like a cute thing to do, right? But there's a lot of us who have been working, we have the work. Uh, and so I'm like, I, you know, I want to make sure that those folks get that support. You get $6,000 mentorship or, you know, people from, you know, who are working in Hollywood, uh, and you get this amazing uh, master classes. And so an undocumented person with no, you know, real name in Hollywood was able to do this. I'm like, you know, can, can other organizations, how other organizations are stepping up? And when we're talking about disrupting systems, which I love the name of the, of the fellowship, the disruptors, 
it's like disrupting the way that um, there's like there's this sort of like no you can't you can't you can't do that because you need a social you need this it's like well in order to disrupt you really need to disrupt you know the systems that are stopping us from from you know really showcasing and it's not until like you are the big you know POC writer that then people are like oh my god let's like talk to them but it's like it took a lot it, it took a lot a lot of people investing and you know you know uh really believing in Issa Rae for Issa Rae to be Issa Rae right and so like but are people asking like what did it what did it take what kind of investment and so that's the kind of work that I'm like really uh you know passionate about and I think I couldn't have done that without um you know everything that I I've learned without my mentors and mentors that I that I met across my you know my my journey uh and my artistic artistic journey now I'm gonna close it with this uh I'm really excited uh to uh uh oh I didn't talk about this pieces but I'm, I'm running out of time I want to make sure that Yossi and I you know get to talk at the end but um I'm you know showing this for the first time um she's an Smithsonian girl so I'm part of a of a show that's uh, um, that opened during a pandemic you know she's in the Smithsonian but you know during a pandemic it's okay it's fine um you know we were able me and uh, my best friend Jesus Iniguez who I I've known since college, um, you know, we started uh, making videos and, you know, he made a short documentary about, you know, my journey to the Smithsonian and like we actually had some time to like film in the Smithsonian. We had like the floor for ourselves, which was so badass. And it was some video. So I'm going to show you like a 50 second uh, trailer that it's going to be coming out uh, either this week or next week. Uh, and so this is the first time I show. So I'll be quiet and I'll share this with you. Um, uh, let me let me find it. Where I put it? Where I put it? Where I go? Okay, here it goes. Enjoy. Okay, we are rolling. Julio, we actually can't. Uh, yesterday, November twentieth. Um, you can't see it. We. No, we still see the presentation. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, For some reason, we can hear it, but we can't see. Okay, let me let me try that again. Sorry. No worries, no worries. I just wanted to catch that before. <laughs> okay, here it goes again. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. Okay, we are rolling. We're going to talk about yesterday, November 20th, 2020, and what it feels like for you as an undocumented and queer artist to have work in one of the most prestigious museums in the United States. And then we're going to rewind 10 years back to 2010 when you first started getting serious about your work we're going to talk about all your significant important pieces you're going to tell me all the backstory all the back drama and we're going to talk about how Julio Salgado ended up on the walls of the Smithsonian okay so yesterday what you think I was tripping I was big time So that's, uh, that's uh, yeah, I was tripping. I couldn't believe it. And, um, you know, during this pandemic, you know, even though a lot of us can, you know, be there, uh, we were lucky to share. And so I was just lucky to, you know, be able to do this with my best friend who I've been, you know, creating with for such a long time. And so be on the lookout for that this at the end of this week. Thank you. all Cool. Thank you so much. That was so cute. I'm so excited for that. Congratulations, Julio. She is documenting. Yes. Um, buenas tardes a todos. Um, again, my name is Yosima Reyes. Super excited to be here. Um, yeah, I think one of the, I think if anything, even that with Jesus and, um, and Julio showing an example of what he's doing, I think one of the things that it's important to talk about is how oftentimes undocumented people we have to rely on each other to make it through another day. And I think undocumented friendships, it's something that needs to be explored. I think building circles around you of support um, is super important and always having, I think it's just awesome to have somebody you don't have to explain to. Like, girl, you know what DACA is. I don't gotta explain it to you. You know, like things like that, that are super, super vital. And I think have been really um, great for me to kind of, you know, practice new things or bounce off ideas when I'm developing work. My focus is mostly writing literature. I'm a nerd. I love writing. I love 
reading. Um, so that's kind of my main focus within what I'm doing. Um, I predominantly write about my own experience because I'm only an expert in what I've lived and what I've been through. So I can only talk about specific things, but I feel that the more nuanced the experience, um, the more universal it becomes and it's been able to connect with people um, throughout the country. I'm from, a, I'm from Guerrero, Mexico, which is Southern Mexico. That's why I'm cute, short and dark. Um, migrated to the United States at three years old, was raised in a neighborhood surrounded by undocumented people. Oftentimes when I was coming out, well, I've never came out as undocumented because there was no need to because everybody I knew in my block lived like this. So when people tell me like, when people would ask me, like, I remember I did one interview for like this important news thing and they kept telling me who was the first person you confessed this to. And I was like, bro, it's not a confession. It is what it is. But they edited me out because I just did not fit the format for the story. So I'm like, girl, you just wasted my time. Um, so I think this has been like the the idea for a lot of undocumented people. I'm probably one of the undocumented people that gets uh, get gets edited out out of things because allegedly I'm too happy um <laughs> and I'm fine with that um so I'm going to share a little bit about kind of like my method or like just what I'm processing when I'm thinking of narratives that we're facing recently I just came out of doing a conversation with Carla Cornejo Vicencio, Marcelo Hernandez Castillo and Jose Antonio Vargas which is really beautiful to see that in 2021 we now have literature written by people that have have the undocumented, have an embodied undocumented experience. Um, one of the things that I'm very careful about noting is the fact that being undocumented is not an identity. I always talk about this, right? Like there's nothing in my body, in my physique, in how, in, in me that is undocumented, as opposed to my queerness, which is in, in everything that I do. Queerness is in how I do my hair, why I chose to wear this shirt. It's like, it's an essence. It's a it's spiritual component to who I am. I always are agree that it is important to differentiate being undocumented. It's a social condition that we're subjugated to, just like poverty, that informs our identity. But it's very important for us to make that distinction because if we don't, if we're not careful, like Maya Angelou says, words are things, right? They'll creep into you and then you become that thing. So it's very important to make that distinction. Um, I always talk about, I feel like sometimes most of the work that I'm doing is against pushing against this kind of way of narratives that we have about undocumented people. I think in, in mass media, we've seen the way that um, undocumented people, we're always a subject. We've been telling undocumented narratives for the last two decades since the introduction of the DREAM Act. And I think Burley in 2020 is when people are kind of discovering that undocumented people are philosophers, we're writers, we're thinkers, we're actually very articulate and can actually formulate sentences to discuss our predicament. Um, I love this quote by Carla Cornejo de Vicencio, The Undocumented Americans. In her introduction, she writes, I fucking hate thinking of migrants as butterflies. Butterflies can't fuck a bitch up. And I feel like that's the energy that I am coming in with 2021, girl. Like 2021, I am on unapolog apologetic means that I'm not making myself small for anybody. Like if you don't recognize that it takes a certain level of genius to survive 20 plus years as undocumented and I am a threat to you, then so be it. Like I'm not interested and pacifying my experience. I'm not interested in persuading you to like me. I'm not interested in that anymore. I think right now what I'm interested in is being a, an example to my community that when you take ownership of your story and you don't let shame take control over you, then it can be a pow powerful thing, right? Because muchas de las veces we are stopped and hindered from dreaming and manifesting things because we think we have guilt that we're not supposed to be in this country or people tell us that we're taking up space but trust and believe that I've worked double or sometimes triple as hard to be where I am and it's not even about merit because if citizenship was about about merit you know this country would have less citizens uh, I'm sorry I'm coming so hardcore <laughs> but it's for a document to be but I'm just trying to let the people know what's good um one of the things that I've been witnessing right is like you know, we see all these documentaries all the time regarding undocumented subjects. Um, and I think one of the things that for me in my work is really realizing that I don't wanna be the subject to somebody's narrative. That's why it's very, it's really beautiful to see that Jesus and Julio are working collectively to put this documentary together simply because you become the, there's a power when you're the agent of the narrative. There's a power when you're able to shape it and decide to share what you wanna share, right? 
I try, I'm still trying to develop this concept of the citizen gaze, right? Which is similarly, arguably, the thing about the white gaze that I talk about in which alleged, uh, allies and good-hearted folks have been conditioned to view undocumented people as folks with no power. We get this from images, movies, documentaries in which our voices are framed as fearful, hiding, and in desperate need of help. Our narratives are always at a deficit. When I was growing up around, und surrounded by undocumented people, I always thought how ingenious we were because we had to rely on each other to find resources, right? Like who would hire you? Who was a reliable coyote? Who was the, where you can get the money gram transfers? Where can you get the tarjetas telefonicas to call Mexico for super cheap? Like it was all word of mouth, right? And I think for me, I found it very interesting that that in a way was some sort of undocumented culture that relied underground, but it wasn't into we hit the, the public sphere that people started coming into our communities and started capturing how we live. But sadly, because they are not part of the community, all they saw what all they witnessed was the ugly and the deficit that we never really saw the intellect behind that. So for me, it was very interesting of like, what happened to all these people that I grew up with who are now cut and edited and mold? My mother put mold as somebody that's fearful. And so for me, I started thinking of like, you know, we're not an audience. So I think, how do I develop poems that are going to inspire my mom, my primas, my tias? Going to be like, oh my God, that's so cool. You know, how do we start thinking of our communities as an audience as opposed to just these people that exist in I don't know what world? So I think for me, like, that's been very important. Like, how am I writing between just being true to myself, but also true to the people that I'm writing about? Um, I always talk about an agency is very important to me. A documented agency refers to the human capability to influence one's actions in the course of events of one's life. I believe that as undocumented people, we've always lived outside of the justification of why we are here and we create networks of survival. We cry, we laugh, we dance, we make love, we exist beyond trying to prove our humanity. Um, I think this is very important to me. Agency is everything. I feel like I, I was making the, the distinction that sometimes when I watch documentaries with undocumented subjects, I feel like I'm watching a Sarah McCollin animal cruelty commercial, like I want like desperately like somebody adopt me. Uh, <laughs> um, but I think for me, like, lo que estoy pensando ahora is like, wow, like I'm blessed that, um, you know, I always say there's nothing beautiful about being undocumented. There really isn't anything beautiful about it. Um, what's beautiful is that we decided to come out and be us coming out, we started to find each other and develop all these folks. So I, so for me, like I decided to make a presentation in which I'm introducing folks who maybe they're not, these artists are not in their realm, but they are existing and creating bodies of work that should be celebrated. This is Brian Herrera based out of Chicago, um, who is um, doing beautiful art pieces, you know, documenting essential workers. Um, Felipe Baeza based out of Brooklyn, New York, who's doing amazing visual work. We have undocumented tales, Barbara Ibanez, based out of Los Angeles, who is a YouTube. It's a YouTube series. If you haven't watched it, you should definitely check it out. Rocio, which is a documentary, which is, it's on Amazon Prime for free. You can you can watch it by Dario Guerrero. Um, and now we have a whole course of literature. We have Children of the Land by Marcelo Hernandez Castillo that was published early last year and accompanied uh, by Javier Zamora, which follows poems about his journey being an accompanied miter from El Salvador. So I think right now, one of the beautiful things is that we're having a whole bunch of artists developing work. And one of the beautiful things is that, that these are the artists that we need to support and elevate because we do have the experience. We are thinkers, we are artists, we are philosophers. And I think it's time now in 2021 for people to realize that we're building national movements. It's important to have undocumented people having conversations on how we want to be represented. Um, and beyond that, I think right now when we're talking about mental health, what, else, what are the examples that we're showing other undocumented people? What if our lives are married to deportation narratives, right? Like we can't exist like that because we're just adding more anxiety to our community. And I think about that often, like how is it that a mom is watching another story? You know, that's why Univision trips us out all the time because it's like, siempre estamos con miedo. But like, how do I develop poems, stories, movies that are going to keep people a mental break or can make them laugh. Um, because you know what? Undocumented people have a sense of humor. It's very dark, but it's there. Um, and I think I, I right now I moved back to San Jose, California, where I become I become the, uh, the main caretaker for my 86-year-old abuela. 
And one of the beautiful things that I'm witnessing is that, like, I want to be able to develop work for the that generation or those folks that we don't talk about. You know, we don't talk about undocumented elders that don't have the luxury of waiting for immigration reform. And right now that we're discussing Biden and his immigration plan, right? It's eight years. Like, does my grandma have eight years left, right? Like, what, what point? Are we having conversations of the things that we give up by us choosing to stay here? So I think that's when I kind of like where I'm at right now. And of course, Toni Morrison already told us everything, right? Toni Morrison, the function, the very serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over your reason for being. Somebody says you have no language, so you spend 20 years proving that you do. Somebody said your head isn't shaped properly, so you have scientists working on the fact that it does. Somebody says you have no art, so you dress that up. Somebody says you have no kingdom, so you stretch that up. None of this is necessary. There will always be more one more thing. And I think if we look at immigration narratives, immigration stories, we've always have to justify in everything. And I think at this point, it's like, it's so distracting. I think at this point, we need to start figuring out for ourselves. And I, I think that's why this class is important um, for ourselves, take inventory on how can we be better better family members to our own family that has all these things they're carrying. How can I show up better for my mom? How can I show up better for my brother, for my sister, who is at the same time in dealing with this? Because I think one of the things that happens is that we've learned that undocumented has become like an identity marker that we can discuss, but we are also aware that we have family members that are documented. It's just like that annoying fly, like mi abuelita all the time. Ay, siempre andas hablando de esas cosas, habla de otras cosas, talk about other things, right? But I think it's very important for me now is figuring out how I can be better to the people. You know, I'm I'm out in the world doing all these things, but how can I be a better, you know, family member to the people that supported me in my journey? Um, I always think about audience. I think right now I have no no problems in stating that my audience right now is and other undocumented people and i think a lot of people think that's limiting but i argue that there's 11 million undocumented people in this country and if that's the only people that are reading my work then i think i'm going to be fine um one of the th questions that i ask myself when even when i'm doing press conferences or doing anything or people are asking me to be part of a project will this story honor my family will this story speak of my legacy will this story inspire my undocumented mother will this story give my undocumented community a mental break will this story make my undocumented father laugh will this story make me cry of happiness that's what i'm focusing right now i'm not interested in talking about all the bad things that happened to me. I'm not interested in talking about my anxiety with deportation. That's not something I'm interested. In. And if I were to be interested in that, hopefully it comes with a check because I need therapy because you're going to trigger me. So these are the things that I'm thinking. And questions to think about. What is undocumented power? When was the last time you felt powerful? And who makes you powerful? Esas señoras that you see in my pictures are my vecinas when you know we were working with this pandemic and I helped fundraise money for them. Um, so they can um, have some sort of access to some sort of aid because we all know that because of our status, most folks did not qualify for a stimulus check and even the $500 they were giving it to us earlier this year, and it's been a year, $500 for undocumented families. And they said one, one check per household and being aware that there's, you know, sometimes we have three undocumented families to a uh, two bedroom apartment. It's, it's very important to have these things in think. Writing prompts, should you be interested in writing and developing new things? Think about an undocumented person in your life that made you feel seen, write a letter to them, use vivid examples of where this action took place. Think of a memory in which you felt proud of an accomplishment. Tell me the story. Um, tell me about your biggest dream you have. How do you define success? This was the biggest one. Um, define success was the biggest thing. I so happened that my mentor is also Jose Antonio Vargas, which is another undocumented person. And one of the things that he asked me was like, what do you do? You can't be afraid of success. And I think for all of most of us who are undocumented, realizing that sometimes you reach a level where you're about to cross over or you're about to push a new boundary that you're not supposed to make it. First of all, you're not supposed to be in college, right? You're not supposed to make it this far. You're going to find yourself at this kind of marriage between selecting between your family and your career. And I think that's the fine line of like select choosing, like, how do I define success? What does success mean to me when in America, a success 
success means having all these accolades and degrees, but at the same time, you know, you have you can't do that. You were not raised in that way because we also have to support our families. So it's a very interesting thing. So I think for us, we need to define success for ourselves. What does undocumented success mean? How do we define that? What does that mean? And does its papers really? That's what I thought now that I'm older. I used to think that once I got papers, that's when my life was going to start. And I realized that, no, like, that's not true. Like, I choose when I become free. And at this point, that's why I'm out here being a desmadroso, haciendo todo lo que tengo que hacer, because if that day ever comes that she needs to exit, I'm going to be like, thug life. I didn't want to be here anyways, you know? So I just think it's very important for us to define these things for ourselves, to live full lives and not be... Um, so yeah, I mean, this is, you can find more on my website, yosimar.com. Yosi Ray, should I be any resource to you? And yeah, this is my presentation. Thank you. Succinct, Good. yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Y'all are always so funny. Um, <laughs> uh, so now I guess we'll just get into a few Q&A. Um, and uh, there's been plenty of great questions in the chat. Um, and I think we will start with, um, sorry, I don't want to mess up your name, but I think it's Adi Said Gonzalez, um, and she's asking about documenting the immigrants movement rights, and, um, do you think that creating art to, or do you create art to empower and docu folks to join the movement and be unafraid to speak on their experiences? And I think um, I'm also thinking about that question in relation to, um, you know, the knowledge that is produced from that place of joy that you all speak of so much. Um, and, you know, what is like, what's, so maybe what's the purpose of that documenting and what knowledge do you think has been produced from undocumented folks from that place of joy that might have gone missing if it hadn't gone documented? Um, so yeah, um, and that's really both of y'all. I personally um, don't, initially I started making art, as I mentioned, right? Like, you know, for myself or uh, to just, there's a lot of things that, one of the things I always like, I'm, you know, there's a lot of things that I'm, I don't have control of. Um, Immigration policy is one of those big ones, right? Um, a lot of the times you don't have control of the way that others are, you know, how others are going to, like the media, right? Like, you know, we talk, you know, Yosimar has talked about media and being interviewed, right? Uh, especially when you have big media companies hitting you up. I'm very, very now, you know, uh, at 37 years old that, <laughs> You, you don't have to say yes. You don't have to talk. You don't owe anybody an interview, right? Like one of my biggest pet peeves is reporters hitting me up, like rushing me like, hey, I have a deadline like tomorrow. Can you like get back to me? And I was like, first of all, um, what kind of professional, unprofessionalism you know, is that? <laughs> As, and also like, you know, when they're, they're uh, sending you questions to reply, like, you know, essentially you're typing and then they copy and paste. Um, because as a journalist, uh, you know, major, I'm like, why wouldn't you want to talk to me instead and, you know, get a juicer story because that's how you get a good story. Right. But I, I, so I don't, a lot of times you don't have control over that. Um, and so, but I have control of the things that I create. Um, and so while I think that it, like the beauty about, um, human beings, some folks, uh, is the capacity to evolve in the narratives, right? Like as artists, um, you know, I when I was younger and um, thinking about this, this, um, yeah, I'm gonna tell immigrants that I'm a good immigrant. I'm gonna tell people that I went to school. I'm gonna show you how, like, you know, I deserve, I deserve, I deserve to be an immigrant. Um, but that shit gets tiring, you know. It gets tiring, and at the end of the day, the people who are not who don't like you, they're not gonna like you, you know? So why continue to, um, you know, waste? I think it's, it's a waste of time a lot of the times to try to convince people, um, you know, uh, that that you deserve rights and that you deserve to be seen as a human being. Um, I would never push anybody to come out out of any closet, you know, don't like, you know, 
there's a lot of amazing folks who are organizing, who are doing, you know, that work. If you don't feel comfortable doing that kind of work, just, you know, just being, if my art like provides that to people just to be seen, um, you know, like that, I feel like that's a sharing on top. Um, I would never, you know, whether it be queer, uh, undocumented, you will know when the time is right. You will know when that's right. And so I think, uh, I guess just a, like a longer way to say like, you know, I, I make stuff for myself uh, and I make stuff, and I don't make stuff for people who don't see me as human. That's that's the reason why you know I create. What about you, Yossi? Yeah, uh, I think for me one of the things you know I think especially using big words like movement, right? I think one of the biggest things that I realize too specifically now is that oftentimes when we do come out or doing this work, we think that we need to be part of this national platform or movement. And it's very, it gets very confusing. And I think for me, one of the things that I always think about is my own, what I, what do I have immediate access to? And I used to think that activism, me, me being at every protest or doing all these things, but you need to think about activism as small acts that can propel somebody, right? Like there's a huge difference between translating an application, filling out an application, helping someone fill out a form, that's activism. And I don't think we start conditioning thinking ourselves as this because we think it's just, oh, we have to do it. But it, even that, I think it's very important to do that and also set boundaries because you are gonna get burned out if you're that person that's at everything and involved in todo el desmadre, but you're not even addressing your own needs. So you're no good if you're just you know burning yourself out. So I think, knowing what your capacity is is very important because I know that plenty of us you it's a good thing that you want to be giving and be at everything but I think it's also important to take a step back and see and always grassroots I think if you go to a grassroots there's no way that because you know your neighbors better and I think that should be the method I know what my neighbors need because I live next to them I know what their immediate needs are so even that I think you should if you think of movement stuff or activism which I don't I think think about how I can be a better neighbor because I think even now with this pandemic we're witnessing the mutual aid is the way that we are going to support one another and I can't go to a community and see what they need because I'm not from there so I think looking at grassroots if you have the means to donate donate to grassroots organizations that are on the ground doing that work so yeah I do have to can I I'll add something to that like that a lot of I always say like you know if it wasn't for the work of like organizers and people who have been doing this you know for a long time um you know like they like I show that picture of you know the folks sitting down Lisbeth, Yahaira, Mo, um, you know Tania and Raul um who like moved me you know this happened around the time that I was I graduated from college and I was like, I can't find a, I want to work at a newspaper. I wanted to be a political cartoonist, but like they really moved me. Right. And so like, there's people who like, who are doing this work, but like, yeah, definitely. Like I, I found my lane <laughs> as a, as a creative, right. Like, and not, and not, and not feeling bad. Like, you know, like, yeah, like you don't, you don't have to go to every single, you know, March that there is, but like you, we all have our ways that we, um, you know, we have our lanes. Thank you both. I'm going to go ahead and ask the next question by, I don't want to, I'm sorry if I um, mispronounced her name, Hans Luhan. He stated something that sparked for me during the presentation was the idea of coming out. How does this apply to, to applies to queer and undocumented experiences? Could you both please elaborate on how you see this? Um, I think for me, the concept of coming out is very interesting because I don't necessarily, I don't even think I came out as, like, I don't think I came out as gay or anything. I think, did I? I'm trying to think if I sat my family down to explain. I don't think I did. I think I've always been, I, maybe it's just how I'm wired, but I've always been things are a matter of fact. Like, como dice Juan Gabriel, lo que se ve no se pregunta, right? So if you can't see it and you can't ask me, um, it is what it is. But I think for me, one of the things, and I think I rebelled against that simply because one, I don't think my queerness is the confession. I think if anything, I think it's a blessing. It is a gift. It's what gives me insight. It's what's been able to make me articulate and view the world in the way that I do. So, uh, I mean, I, what would I be writing about if I was straight? What do straight people write about? Well, shout out to, we accept you. We love you. I'm just kidding. I don't want to alienate you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I know, I don't know. I don't know. And then when undocumented stuff, like I've always, 
kind of I've always known, I've always been aware of it. I didn't feel like it needed to be a confession. Like I seriously was doing this thing of like, did I tell it to a teacher? To a, It was just common knowledge. I mean, if I went to my high school, I wasn't the only one, there was a lot. And I think that's the privilege too of me. Well, I don't know if that's a privilege, but whatever, of growing up in California and being in position in Eastside San Jose and just being surrounded. And this is the early nineties, right? Elementary school. This is Prop 187 in 1994 with Pete Wilson that, you know, also in the, we had, we still have bilingual ed. I still have bilingual ed until I was like in, in, in fifth grade is when they started taking that. So I think it was very evident that if you were a bilingual education uh, ESL classes and stuff like you were you know that was the status so I think it was just common knowledge I never really had a confession did you hold you you had a confession I did <laughs> uh and my mom can hear me uh but it, it was so silly though I mean I I look back at, at the way that you know I came out um it was it was through a book through a through a journal through a sketching pad like I had I so my best friend in the eighth grade had told me that you know like he was bi and I was like oh my god I think I might be bi too and like my mom when I was like I was like 18 like she magically found this sketchbook and it magically opened to that part <laughs> that I said and she was she sat down and and she she asked me she was like hey you know like um I found this um and again right like I go back and I think about my Tio Chicho who opened that, like my Tio Chicho was like, I'm here. Uh, and you know, he was, on, he was and, and you know, this he, he moved to the US um, in the late eighties, early nineties, um, you know, as an undocumented and queer, like there was like no language for that. He was just being right. And so like, in essence, he had created a little roadmap for me and even that, you know, like and a part of that was him by the time that he came out, like that's my mom's brother. Um, my mom was like more understanding. And I know how lucky and blessed I am because that is not the experience of a lot of people. Um, so, you know, it was it was very it was it was it was nice. And, you know, of course, I was like, don't tell my dad, you know, like it took me a little longer. But the fact that my uncle had created that path. Um, you know, within my family, what I did, uh, um, you know, when it came to like my cousins and my tias, um, you know, my mom was like, you know, can I tell your tias? I'm like, I don't care. You know, you could tell. And when some of my tias will find out, I was like, how come you didn't, you didn't tell me that, you know, it's totally fine. Like, I was like, why should I tell you, you know, like, why should I, you know, like be so, because it is a vulnerable moment, right? That like, you know, sharing so much of you that like, you never told me when, you know, whatever vulnerable moment you needed to share, right? Like there is this, there is a sort of um, feeling that you don't, you know, you don't have, I didn't want to tell the undocumented part. You, like, yeah, I'm on the same, you know, tip as Yosimara that I grew up in, you know, here in LA where there was a lot of us, a lot of undocumented people. Um, I would get very nervous about like when I would meet like older undocumented people that I saw that they were, they, a lot of us worked at the Swami together uh i um you know and so like a lot for a lot of folks it was like well this is what i'm gonna be doing or you know do um you know i can't like college was out of the question so like i was seeing how a lot of very you know folks who wanted to go to school were like that's not an option um so i would get i would get very nervous about my own my own future but just sharing you know, like, yeah, sometimes you didn't, you didn't have to say anything. And then like, of course, your family, who's like also undocumented, there was never that. Um, my dad, my dad became a little, he got a little nervous when I would start being a little too public about being undocumented and going to events. Cause he was like, um, why do you have to tell people that you're undocumented? I was like, I don't know that. Cause you know, we, well, I mean, I knew why, right? Like the more, as I mentioned, the more the more the more you come out, the safer you feel, which again was borrowed from the coming out of the closet um, narrative. But my dad, my dad, I think he he was feeling a little more like for my safety, you know. And later on, I mean, a lot of people meet my dad, they're like, oh, your dad is so cool with, you know, with you being queer. I'm like, it took a lot of work to get that man where he's at. But um, I'm just happy that I'm, I got I got lucky with my family. I don't know if that answered the question. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I'd love to thank y'all for sharing your stories. Um, and so the, the next question is from um, one of the students 
in our class. Um, so big shout out to Ms. Maricia. Um, she's asking, how did you all discover your art? Did you always know it was a part of you? And when did you first express it outside of yourself? Like when did you first come to realize your art? Um, I was, uh, I think you've been, okay, so middle school, I was talking about middle school being the hardest years for me, simply because, you know, we have the narrative that high school's hard, but middle school, middle school students are harsh, okay, and I wasn't, especially middle school hood students are definitely more hardcore, even when I do lectures at high middle school, I'm like, I don't want to do more middle school, me da miedo, but I think for me, it was, I'm, I'm 12, I'm between 12 and 13, navigating, walking to school every day, right, I'm navigating my sexuality, hormones, figuring out, like, I'm not like everybody else, I'm more feminine than the other boys, um, I'm deep poverty, sleeping on the living room floor next to my grandmother, my grandfather, navigating all of that with recycling bottles and cans. Um, and then my status, I'm undocumented. I don't know what that means. I just know that when I turn 16, I can't get a driver's license. That's all I know. And navigating all of this. And I think for me, I've always been kind of reclusive in the way that I've been in my thought process. So I would hang out at the library. Um, and shout out to librarians because librarians really be out here putting in that work. Uh, I had a, this librarian, una señora Latina, and she was like, she saw that I would come in. It was my safe space because nobody bothers you when you're reading, right? Like, oh my God, this person is meditating. This person's smart. They're reading. Let's not bug them. And so I would be reading all the time, but I would read like middle school level like books. Um, and shout out to new now that YA is a big thing. Like we're having so many amazing YA books written by like, queer people, people of color. I'm so excited for that. Um, but I was reading the boxcar kids and stuff like that. But then she was like, I think you need to read this book. And it had so happened to be The Color Purple by Alice Walker. I read that book and I think it made me, it gave me perspective. And I realized like, wow, this is really, really dope. I want to figure out how I can do this. And I started journaling since middle school. And then it was into to high school that my English teacher was like, you need to do um, public speaking because you're too shy, but you have a lot of things to say when you speak in class, so do public speaking. And I didn't like public speaking. One, I have, my name is Yosimar, so everybody thought that my name was after la novela Marimar. So I had that going against me. And the thing that happens, I don't know about you, but we're queer people, especially if you're like gay and in the hood, is you feel that your voice is going to it's what's going to tell people you're gay, right? Because just how you talk and like the influation and the, I think there needs to be a study on vocal cords. <laughs> um, and so that's why I didn't want to public speak. But then once I did, I think I discovered like, wow, this is powerful. I can tell people all this bad shit that I'm going through and they can't judge me because they don't fucking know me. So I think that was a process in, that I started developing and writing about all these things that I have was carrying and I was able to release them. So that's how I kind of came to now be what I am. I don't see you as such you being a shy person. That's very unlike you. <laughs> For, it, it, but you know what? Yeah, like I think, I think, yeah, kids, I mean, God, kids, um, you know, and 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 especially like other, you know, like the other brown kids who will like make fun of you, A, for like not speaking English, um, you know, like my Payless shoes, like that was always my thing, <laughs> like you Payless shoes making fun of, uh, you know, and but but for me, what I found at an early age was that I, you know, like I was, and I'm sorry for any teachers here, any professors, but like, you know, I was always drawing, you know, like the professor and like the teacher, like, you know, like making fun of them cartoons. Um, and then like kids next to me, like, damn, you know, you could draw, like, let's be friends. And, and really, you know, it, it really became it, it, like, I was the kid, like, I was always the one who could draw, and, like, you, you know, in group projects and everything, like, everybody wanted to be part of my project uh, my or my group because, you know, Julio was the one who could draw and, you know, he could get us an A. And so I, I think, uh, you know, I think artists, I mean, I don't know if this is true for you, Yossi, but like, you know, I became like a, like, ple I wanted to please people. And like, you know, I wanted to be liked. <laughs> I wanted to be liked. And so um, I think drawing um, and like drawing friends um, was a way to, to like, you know, make, make friends. Um, then, you know, when I, when I started, um, when I started um, in, what's, I, I think, yeah, cause I was like part of the art club and like the yearbook staff. Uh, I just found my yearbook, well, I won't show you, but um, you know, like I was always finding ways to, uh, 
like getting at people telling you like oh my god you're you're good like you know you you start and not just like teachers but like other your your peers like your kid for other kids you believe it right and so um so I think that was that was for me um something that I was like okay I I, I can do that it was not until I hit college that you know there's something about like when you grow up in like adulthood <laughs> that you know or early adulthood that that takes away that 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 creative part of you uh, whether, you know, I, so my first, I, I mentioned that I was a, a journalism major, but initially I was an art major and, um, and I, you know, I started, uh, like literally the summer after high school, um, I joined, um, you know, like an art class and like the art teachers were so harsh. Looking back, I understand maybe like that's how, what makes you stronger, but like it, like it killed my passion for 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 art like I had some friends who were like music like art, like music majors and they hated it and so like I stopped and and I'm like how is it that something so great and creative then like you know gets like it wasn't as fun as it used to when I was a little kid um you know but like I try to tap into that like you know why did I originally wanted to draw and like um you know it's just you know doodling and drawing you know it's it's still like the thing. I I I err like whenever you're feeling down, bring out a notepad and you know, just do it all draw. Thank you for sharing. That was very powerful. We're gonna group the next questions together because they're they're similar. And they go, um, how do you how do you envision your art supporting your loved ones and, and other immigrant communities? And the next question, the second question is. How can we honor our elders, the non-immigrant youth that never got the chance or the opportunity for school? Those like Julio Steele's, like Julio Steele and Yosimar Sabolita, our elders growing up that were always there. You know, one of the things that I realized is that everybody wants to be heard. If you think about it in social media, that's why people are arguing on comments where you don't know, because people just want to be heard or just, you know, just want to feel like seen and I think one of the things specifically with this pandemic is very interesting because you know my grandma can't go nowhere like thankfully right now she has the vaccine um but I just feel for undocumented and elders in general that we can't take them nowhere and you know like especially with immigrants and Latinos we love to be around hella people um so I think right now she's definitely feeling it and I think one of the things that I've been doing with her it's just listening to her, even though she told me, she, I already know this story because she already told me it like 50 times. At least I'll ask her for clarifying details so I can get a more uh, picture. And I think she enjoys that. I think having those communications with elders, especially parents, um, it's just because you think about, think about it in this country, nobody, what it feels like to not be heard, to not even be seen, right? Like to go to these jobs. My mom used to work at a Togo's. Um, and to be making sandwiches for people and people not even see you like it's just like a, like you're just supposed so I think people just want to be seen so I think even expressing that in conversations if you do have the opportunity and access having conversations with that what were their dreams what did they think about what are their aspirations what are they what are their current dreams what do they want to manifest I think it's very important to continue that because it's very easy for us to just look at our parents as parents and not really look at them as them also surviving this machine that is created for us to just self-deport. So how can we be better to show up for one another? The thing that I'm telling my grandma right now is teaching her like how to tell a story because I was telling her that I want to write her stories, but I can't because it's crisis, 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 crisis. I was like, even La Rosa de Guadalupe has a story arc. And we already know when the va sopla el viento that we're going to have a resolution. And so I use that to kind of tell her like, okay, you're going to tell me the story, but tell me also about the good things. Because if you know anything about my grandparents, it's we only remember the bad and the negative. And yes, that's important to get out, but it's also important to understand how do we also talk about the good things that came from that. So I try to figure out that. That has kind of been my method to, to doing that. And we're in a pandemic, so I think we have nothing but time to hopefully discuss with our elders. Yeah, that's that's super, super, super important to like, you know, have, you know, a lot of the times, um, you know, activists, academics, they would, you know, they're like talking 
on their own or like throwing this like intersectionalities and like all this word I'm like can you ex would you be able to explain that to your family you know people who don't speak you know the language and so um like you know you'll see you know I recently you know I'm living with my family again right and so um that in itself is um you know this pandemic it you know it hit a lot of us hard and you know that you know especially like when you're undocumented and and um you know it's just it was it was bad and so i'm i'm very i'm very i always tell my friends i'm like y'all lucky that you have you know a queer kid you know not a queer kid a queer adult with like no i don't have any kids i don't have any children so i i'm able you know gracias a dios thank god i have a job that i can i'm able to you know provide um but one of the things that i you know that i that i that i said to them was like you know we we need to be like we need to talk we need to be honest we need to stop you know any cycles of like I, I don't want to worry you or like, I don't, I don't want to say something because I don't want to, I'm like, it stresses me out more not to know and then find out. And so it's just like being super direct, um, you know, that, that, because yeah, we we're, we're so used to um, um, this cycles of, of silence and secrets for the sake of protection. Um, and so I, I think, you know, you know, Yossi mentioned Carla's book uh, that talks about mental health. I'm like all in, you know, I'm, I'm in, you know, I, that's the thing, you know, she started therapy at 37 now. Uh, and it's really the things that I'm, I'm getting there and how am I going to bring them home and how I'm, how I'm going to be sharing, you know, with that, with them and, and, and explaining to my family. I'm like, the other day I was talking to my mom about like, you were younger than me when you came here with two kids, one, a little gay kid, you know, and, and how did you do it? You know, like the, 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 the things that they can teach other people. Uh, right. But it's not seen because it's not in a book because it's not in a, you know, it's not seen as, I don't know, but yeah, like those, those stories, um, you know, I will forever, um, you know, take with me and just, I'm just very thankful that I have them with me that I, that, you know, that I can, like spending every moment, and I'm like, we're lucky that we're we're together uh, because again, this pandemic, not every, not a lot of people have have been lucky. Don't mean to turn it into a, uh, you know, but it's just it's it's a it's a very, it's a very it's a thing. And another thing, uh, like, um, you know, that I, you know, even though there's there's still some limitations, right, to what you can do. And this pandemic really showed its head, right? Like I am talking and I'm so excited to like, of course, I'm gonna tell everybody that I'm on the Smithsonian, I'm gonna show it up and I'm gonna tell you know people about our accomplishment, but finding, because I had to find housing, you know, during a pandemic, finding housing with people that don't, you know, like if you don't have a social security, like, you know, I'm supposed to be like, a, like in paper, I'm supposed to be good, right? But I, I couldn't, I had to fight to provide that, right? Um, and, and it's just like, we're so, it's just, it, it's, it's, I was so excited, you know, and Yossi and I were, you know, would talk because we were kind of dealing with the same thing and having Yossi, you know, she's having somebody who understands those, those struggles. It's just so, it was, it was beautiful. Thank you, Yossi, for <laughs> All those conversations that we have about that. Thank you so much for your answers. But you say that would you like to ask the next question? Yes, thank you guys. Um, so the next question is from Roya Koram. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your last name. Um, but she says both my mother and I are big fans of your work, Julio. My mom is an Iranian immigrant. She received her documents in the 90s. I am a non-binary stu student in ethnic and queer studies. We talk about futurism, dreaming, and success. We love your 2014 What Future piece. So the question is, what did dreaming agency and queer futures feel, feel like in that piece? And how do thoughts on futures feel almost a decade later? Thank you. That's that's really sweet. Uh, the piece that they're talking about, uh, what future the present is all I see, was a piece that I made um, because I think for me personally, thinking about the future growing up was hard. You know, like you live day by day, you live paycheck by you know to paycheck, um, and and that that piece was you know it's me like how I started making a lot of like you know 
self portraits uh, um, and and really, you know, they're like reflections uh, of 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 my worries, right? Um, again, I mentioned that when I create something and it's it's out in the world, it's like there, like you release it, and and you know, I'm I'm we're very we're very lucky to be able to have this creative side on us that you know we should. I don't have any qualms about you know sharing a lot of stuff that I share in my art, and so but it's it it's it, it, it's hard. It's a lot of the times because you are dealing with the with the with the with the current, you know, with what's happening now, you know, the next, yeah, the next, the next thing that, that you're going to have to deal with. And so um, it takes me, it takes me, I don't know, I, I have a really hard time thinking about the future. I try creating pieces like that um, to suit myself, to be like, you're going to be fine, Julio, it, you know, it's going to be okay. Um, I also, I'm very, I'm always very thankful that people you know, see themselves reflected in the, in the art, but I try to think about that because it's a lot of responsibility. And so, uh, and, and always saying like, I, I don't know if it's going to be fine, but for now, for now, I'm good. I, I'm still working on futurism stuff. Y tu, Yossi? Um, manifesting. I think one of the things that I'm doing right now is definitely looking, not feeling guilty for, having things I think that's the other thing that we always sometimes as people that grow up poor as people were afraid of success in that way so I think right now my thing is like if I'm able to support my family if my family's able to like relax we're supposed to I take a break I think I'm really really happy with that but also noting that that is normal and there's should have, and it's sad it's really sad that we think that having a break is a luxury but I think um I think right now it's just manifesting peace of mind I want my grandma to be happy my grandmother already went through a lot and if I can make my grandma smile and have her less worried that's my that's my goal and I think it's also just so so important to be thinking about futures and um practicing that that discipline of hope um and so the next question is um something that caught the audience's attention was the concept of the citizen's gaze. Um, and we're wondering if you can talk a little bit more about that, you'll see, and um, maybe how you developed it conceptually. And um, yeah, if you can speak about it a little bit more and its significance. Yeah, I think one of the things that for me was very interesting, I um, mean, I think right off the bat, the May 1st boycotts of 2001, right, like the Great American Boycotts, when we saw this mass demonstration, I was in high school, but what was very interesting to me during those demonstrations is that by the talking points during that time, especially in San Jose, with those marches was that the, there was a consensus made that we should wear white and wear Ameri wave American flags because if we didn't, and you know about Mexicans, we're so nationalist and that's a whole another topic within itself. Um, but I think there was this idea that if we wave American flags and wear white, we showcase that we wanna be integrated into the country and come in peace, like, you know? But it was very interesting to me within that because I was very aware that in during that time, we, there was an, um, uh, 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 like a coming out of the shadows movement, yeah, like it was now. Like, so I'm thinking about that, like who were the undocumented people that were even in that, th those rooms to discuss that? And I can uh, assure you that the people creating those kind of narratives who did not foresee that in the near future we were gonna be fighting that and be detrimental to us because now we're discussing about good immigrant and bad immigrant narratives. They didn't really see that. And I think for me, that's what I mean about the citizen gaze is that we've kind of, there was a, it was strategic to push, to push undocumented subjects as martyrs, as pobrecitos. It was strategic, right? Because it pacifies the racial anxiety that this country already faced within us, within us being brown subjects. And so for me, I think that's what I talk about, how like we weren't part of that. And I think now that we are really stating that we want to, talk about different things. I want to be interested in discussing other things other than my anxiety with deportation. I think that's what I mean. And I think even major nonprofit organizations that are immigration nonprofits, like can we talk about who are the undocumented people leading those discourses? Are they hiring undocumented people? Are undocumented people part of those conversations? And I can assure you that most of the time we're not. We're just 
we're just kind of like, we're just brought up on podiums when people need like a testimony. And I think that beyond, we exist as undocumented people beyond testimony. We're actually thinkers, strategists. We know this life because we survived it. We know this. So I think for me, that's what I mean by, and also audience wise, when we tell these stories, the audience is not your mom. The audience is not your dad. The audience is not your prima. It's not your primo. The audience is what they call the movable middle, like especially people with vote, like those people with voting power that they don't like, they don't know yet. Like, oh, do I like immigrants or not? Like, I need a compelling story to make me feel like I can adopt one. And so I think for me, like that's the more thing that for me was like, I'm not interested in that. Like, if you don't even know, I don't want to convince you. Like, I'd rather choose my own community. So I think I think I I that's what I mean by that gaze. And you'll see it in the documentaries. There's so many documentaries. You watch them and you do. And if you're undocumented, you watch the documentaries, but you don't feel inspired. We become just another story, another face. You don't remember the name of these people because we're so desensitized from these narratives. So that's kind of what I, I mean by that. And I still have more time, I need more time to develop a little bit more, but in essence, that's kind of what I'm thinking about when witnessing this. Mm -hmm. That, that's why I'm so um, interested in like, you know, like the world of the, I mean, when you think about Hollywood, right? Uh, I mean, it sounds so superficial, but just the way that our, um, our narratives have been created for us, right? Like it's so like, I, you know, I don't just want to hear, you know, or see a story about, um, you know, uh, either this super good immigrant who like, you know, got there, you know, went through, you know, through the school, which is real respect, you know, a lot of us, you know, who had who went to that. Um, but like in the middle, in between, like sh white people <laughs> get to have, they get it to be so complex. You know, you get mm -hmm. stories about, you know, like I was watching, you know, the show Barry on HBO about like a serial killer and like how he takes art class, you know, or like, you know, uh, classes about acting um, and you fall in love with the, you know, or with the characters. A show like Friends, <laughs> Friends with six people hanging out at a coffee shop, um, you know, she loved the show, but I'm like, why, you know, why is it that that people are, you know, I get to be complex, right? And so I think that, um, you know, when when Issa Rae, I keep mentioning, Issa, I love Issa Rae, uh, came out with, you know, and she was like, it's for black people, you know, it's, 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 that's, that's who she's, you know, writing for. And, um, and I think that I think, you know, black women in Hollywood are just, you know, changing the game. And, um, you know, we should learn, you know, from from a lot of a lot of those amazing uh, folks who are are creating, um, you know, those things. So I'm, that's why I'm interested in like sort of going in there, and I'm like, okay, let's 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 invest. Let's you know, let's practice. Let's you know, how often do you write? You'll see, like you know, how do you how much how much of it? I I mean, I'm interested just to share. Like, huh? I mean, right now, I think for me, one of the things that is conceptualizing all the hood shit that we went through. I'm like, I don't know if the country is ready to see undocumented people smoke blunts. Like, are we ready for that? And are we ready to not criminalize that? Because it's, I mean, I'm saying after dealing with all this stress, girl, at the end of the day, you just need a little puff, you know? So I'm thinking about this kind of multitude of embodiment. And even me saying that right now, I'm like, it's going to seem like, oh my God, are they going to use this for <laughs> when I'm petitioning? But it's like, it's just like at some point, something's got to give and we cannot the social pressure of being good all the time. I know so many undocumented people that carry this constant anxiety of not doing things because they feel they're going to get in trouble. And girl, you're not going to get in trouble. You know, like these this constant surveillance that yeah. we exist under. And that is not a way to live. So I think for me, that's one of the things that, that's why I also criticize the citizen gaze because there's people who don't embody this experience that monetize and capitalize on that while the subjects that they just work with are still in the same predicament and there was no fun set aside for this person to at least pay for therapy while they give you. So it needs to be, I mean, I feel like the trans, it needs to be a uh, collaborative, the process within the, that storytelling, how do we make it collaborative as opposed to extraction? And I think undocumented communities are been conditioned to think that the only way to tell our story is through the process of extraction. And that's not true. You can tell it the way you want to tell it. So don't let people extract 
knowledge or lived experience from you. Yeah. Definitely agree with all that. Like, it's just, like, I think just a couple things that I want to uplift is, like, the importance of, like, the agency within the representation and um, the, you know, I just thought it was so interesting earlier how Yossi was sharing with us about how the reporters would censor him when he was too happy. <laughs> like, that is just so bizarre to me. Um, but I think, um, Ivan, did you want to ask the next question? I think uh, Briseida was up next. Yes. Okay, so these are two questions for Julio from Gina Langhout. Um, where can we learn about view in the documentary and uh, when it comes out and uh, when is it out? Also, they said, thanks Julio. I saw you when SIN brought you out back in the day <laughs> and then they say, Julio, how do we get a print of I Challenge You, I Challenge Me? Is it sold out on your website? Thank you. Thank you so much for those questions. So um, yeah, so the, the documentary, we're going to release it uh, uh, for free, of course, uh, on my website, uh, juliosalgadoart.com. Uh, and if you follow me on my Instagram, uh, I've just... Uh, you know, like the intricacies of uh, of uh, websites that we're we're putting it together and you know doing, but it should be out either by the end of Friday or next or next uh, or next Monday. We're trying to figure out like what's what makes more sense. Um, so you can see it there, juliosalgado.com. Uh, and if you follow me on Instagram, uh, juliosalgado83, I will you know make sure and put the trailer in there. Um, my my online and and I have a I have a a link to my to my online store. Um, and you can, you know, purchase some of my art in there. There is a pause right now. It's just as artists, we are our own, you know, promoters. We are, we have to like, you know, you know, figure our own, you know. You, if I can give one, you know, I know we, we don't. We live. Listen, we live in a capitalistic society, and I wish I could pay my rent with a poster, but that's not how things work. And I wish they could teach us about taxes and like how to become, you know, little businesses, but they don't teach us these things. And a lot of times you figure this out as you're 37 years old. So uh, my, I'm, I'm like updating my, my, uh, my online store. So I'm hoping that by the end of the month or <laughs> early February, I mean, early March, uh, it'll be up and running. Uh, but there's my online store is there. So just follow me. I'll be giving, you know, updates, um, you know, in, in there. So thank you for Thank you for the support also, thank you. Well, um, we have a few minutes left, so we just wanna close out by saying thank you all so much for um, joining us and being in conversation with us while we think about um, the um, struggle for migrant justice. And um, yeah, just thank you all so much. Um, I mean, they say that do you all want to say anything um, before we close? Yeah, thank you so much for um, joining us today. And um, we hope to include this in our in the work for our class to continue on um, the organizing uh, efforts on campus for uh, undocumented students at UCSC and beyond. And yeah, uh, just want to reiterate a big shout out to, to Julio and Yosimar, and especially um, for continuing to visit our campus. I know Julio had had come a, a few times and Yosimar back when uh, the SYNC Collective, Undocumented Student SYNC Collective back in the day was organizing before DACA was a thing and we appreciate it. Uh, did you say that? Yeah, thank you so much for coming uh, with us today. Honestly, it was so inspiring and I really look up to you too. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you so much. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I just wanted to say as well that um, if you aren't familiar with Yosimar and Julio's work, go online and check it out. It's amazing to delve into their respective work. So please do that. And thank you again so much for joining us. We are so appreciative. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you for having us. Hopefully you had fun. And if anything, just know that, you know, it's really inspiring and know that, you know, folks are creating spaces for us and for us, by us. And it's important that we do have this kind of 
and I wish you much luck. And hopefully this becomes more than a course. It becomes a whole study, you know, like exactly. a whole. Yeah. So muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.